ready for takeoff. We are cleared for takeoff. Five, four, three, two, one. Time to take flight in your community and in your life. This is Audio Airstrike. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Everett Hall McNeil, and this is Audio Airstrike, episode 201. We appreciate you listening, as always. And my guest with me at this time is a jack-of-all-trades. He is a professional wrestler, an actor, and a singer. Ladies and gentlemen, with me at this time, reoccurring guest, Miguel Lyons is with us, a.k.a. some of you know him as Patrick. Hey, Hello, man, thanks for coming what's out, happening, man? man? We finally get to be in person. Yeah, we do definitely. No more Zoom calls. Hello. Yes, no more Zoom calls. That's, yeah. <laughs> I know past <laughs> episodes, outside of you uh, coming over the house, and we yeah. didn't do video for that one, but outside of all that, it's mostly been Zoom calls. Uh, so this is really the first time we've done a podcast in a long time in person like this. Uh, so, yeah, man, I'm going to get right into it. Look, the red lights are behind us. You know what time it is. Uh, we're going to review The Batman. Um, we're going to do a quick a quick uh, movie review for you guys, something a little different. Um, I want to start off by saying right out the gate, uh, some of you Bamas owe Robert Pattinson a huge apology. Facts. Uh, and I will go on and I will say this. Um, there's a lot of you that didn't look deeper into his catalog that thought that this man was nothing more than a Harry, actor yep. that was Edward Cullen or, or Harry, Harry Potter. Potter yep. That's all y'all looked at. Y'all did not pay attention. And hey, I have the receipts right here of his whole filmography that he has done. I Check could go down Lighthouse. the list. Lighthouse, Good Time, mm-hmm. um, Remember Me, which was right after he did Twilight. Mm-hmm. And he was also in, oh my God, the dude was Inception as well. Woo. Well, he did Tenant with he did uh, Tenet Christopher too. Nolan. Yeah, so like he was one of the, uh, you know, one of the better one of the better parts of Tenant next to and David then Washington. High Life, High Cosmo, Life, uh, yeah, and then that's uh, Cosmo Metropolis. Yeah, the uh, Cosmo uh, Metropolis. Yeah, yeah. and um, I, uh, I mean, look at the resume, Lost City of Z. That's about, you know what I mean? Like he just did a whole lot of stuff that you guys missed out on where you really see the, oh, and and let me not, especially him paying the pat the pastor in the devil all the time. Yo, fam, come on around. And then hit it with the accent. You're like this man is, has shown a lot of range when it mm-hmm. comes to what he's able to do. And if you haven't taken a look at all those things that he has done, you're missing out on some great quality acting. I, I'll put it to you like this way, in my personal opinion. He is, when it comes to um, actors, he is in that tier that Leo is in, yeah. to me. He's that weird, for me, he's like that weird, non getting the type of recognition he deserves, kind of like uh, Jared Leto, mm-hmm. in a way. Um, you know what I'm saying, but when you, as a as a movie goer, when you, quote unquote, typecast uh, actor in a certain way because they did a certain film, like that man hasn't touched any mainstream film. You know, pretty much since Twilight, everything else has been indie films, majority outside of a um, couple of Netflix releases. Right, right, Netflix yeah. uh, outside of Tenant, really. Um, you know, because I mean, he's worked with a mini director, but I mean, and he's worked with some of the greatest. I mean, if you if you haven't seen Lighthouse with Willem Dafoe, like if you don't watch it for Robert Pattinson, at the least, you're going to watch it for Willem Dafoe. And you know what I'm saying? Like, even if you're not that big of a movie person, you're going to watch Willem Dafoe because Willem Dafoe is Willem Dafoe. Boondock Saints, um, Spider-Man. John mm. Wick, whatever the case may be, if if it's a Willem Dafoe movie, you gonna go out and go see it because Willem Dafoe, right? You know? And I and and that is the beauty of honing in on your craft and really taking it seriously and not allowing the outside voices to typecast you and be like, oh, you're only the teen heartthrob in this particular right. role, and this is where you need to stay. We don't listen to a lot of film critics, uh, well, at least the ones that are salacious and want to typecast people, is because you're not given a chance for the actors to grow mm-hmm. and really see. Um, me, myself, personally, like, was I a big fan of the Twilight series? No. Mm-hmm. Was I a big fan of Robert Pattinson's acting? 
Yes. So I gave it a chance when it was announced a couple years ago. And I said it right on this pod. I'm going to give him a chance to play Batman. Mm -hmm. In my personal opinion, I think one of the reasons, one of the biggest reasons why he was picked because of his range Mm -hmm. and his ability to play a brooding character when you need him to. Now, I will say this. In terms of Robert Pattinson, um, I would have liked to seen more. uh, And this just goes to Matt Reeves directing. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen a more colorful Bruce Wayne like when he's out in public he's not he doesn't come off like socially awkward like he did in this one Mm -hmm. I would have liked him to see to kind of be like hello you know so the scene where you know he comes out to the he goes to the where now keep in mind folks there could be spoilers in this as we're talking so hint hint if you haven't seen it yet don't listen to this wait until you've seen it then listen don't get mad because we about to definitely talk about some stuff um and one of the things that I want to tell you is I personally, and this is my only criticism with what he did, mm. I would have liked to seen a more charismatic Bruce Wayne. To me, when he was Bruce Wayne, he was more socially awkward at times, mm. especially in that uh, funeral scene. Mm. Um, and I would have liked him to, you know, show kind of more of a charismatic side that Christian that Christian Bale was able to do to mm. a point, but after thinking about it, I think the reason being why Matt Reeves may have decided to go that route is because this guy is more comfortable being Batman than Bruce Wayne and the person. I mean, like for me, um, you know, I am a fan of Twilight, um, (laughs) but I wasn't like, I didn't like Robert Pattinson wasn't like, okay. So like for me, like I am a Twilight fan, like, um, but I'm more of a Jacob Black fan, so majority I watched it for Taylor Lautner than mm-hmm. anything else. Um, but I've been behind Robert Pattinson, like being announced as Batman, literally since day one. Um, you know, for the most part, I don't know if the Boss Logic, if none of you know, Boss Logic is a, a Instagram artist, but he also does other art as well. Um, you know, Boss Logic pretty much makes things happen. Like fan stuff happen. Like, and I love the fact that like he'll do some type of art with a with a actor or actress that we would have never thought or we have thought of as fans. And it pretty much started from there, dude. Like, so you know, when everybody was like, "Well, who's going to be the new Batman after you know Ben Affleck and all that other stuff?" Like, um. You know, since Ben was leaving because of what, everything that was going on with Zack Snyder and his family and Ben with his relationship and his family, you know, and then they said he was going to step away and that him and Matt Reeves had creative differences. Like everybody was wondering who the next Batman was, um, you know, and when Boss Logic posted like that random art of Robert Pattinson as Bruce Wayne, I was like, yo, that's kind of weird, but that's also kind of dope at the same time because it's like different you know what i'm saying it's it's kind of like in a sense where you know there's a lot of rumors going around that daniel radcliffe may be a alternate universe wolverine in doctor strange Mm -hmm. so like it's very different because you're taking people who like you would never go to um first as somebody who could do a bruce wayne or batman personally um i love robert pattinson um, if I was going to do the, like that middle age Batman, if that's what they was going to go for before they decided to do the, the type that they did, I would have chose John Hamm mm-hmm. to be um, Bruce Wayne and Batman. And I would have went with Tom Selleck for Commissioner Gordon because, I mean, Tom Selleck, I mean, watch Blue Bloods. You, that's Commissioner Gordon. Right. Like, but. Um, but you definitely think that the casting was very unique. Perfect. Part, like so like this is my whole thing a lot of people that i see a lot of the reviews that i see whether if people were let that love the movie i've seen more people say that they love the movie than more people say that they didn't like the movie right. and that goes not just with people who have like officially review Remember stuff to talk more in the mic but also uh that's not just people who officially review the movie um but i've also seen it with like like some friends of mine and stuff so um you know, personally, 
you know, I like what they did because I'm a com- I'm a avid comic book reader, you know, and I'm a huge, huge DC fan, even more so a huge Batman fan. And as a Batman fan, I give anybody a chance to play their own iteration of Batman because it's always going to be different, just like the comic books. There's always different iterations and different stories and different timelines, you know, of said superhero. You've seen it with Into the Spider-Verse. You've seen it with, um, you know, like different timelines of like Iron Man. Like you, you've seen with, with Justice, like the Justice League or the JSA or Earth 2 or Earth whatever, you know. So, um, you know, I believe every actor who plays a comic book character should have their time in the light to give their own portrayal of that said character or how they think this character would be. Mm-hmm. Um, I loved it from beginning to end. I'm glad that they did Bruce and Bruce, uh, Bruce and Batman as the same person. I didn't want him to be. Um, you didn't want him to fake and be. No, I know. My thing was is like I didn't want him to be. Um, like because like and that and what you said like a lot of people was like well what happened to the glitz and glamour Bruce versus you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. like I love that there was no distinction between Bruce and Batman because this is the first time we've ever seen Bruce within his second year of being Batman yeah so he's not going to have finesse he's not going to have granite. And it's the biggest thing that everybody, another big thing that everybody keeps saying is like, oh, he's a billionaire, so he should be blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's real life logic. That's not comic book logic. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yes, he has billions of dollars, but you're talking about, you know, somebody being in their second year of being Batman um, who is still dealing with the loss of his parents. You know, so um, majority, if, if if you're a comic book reader, then you know that, you know, Bruce became Batman before Superman, before Clark became Superman. Mm-hmm. Bruce was like in his uh, mid to late 20s mm-hmm. and Clark was in his his early 30s. Like, mm-hmm. you know, so um, they became heroes for two different reasons. You know what I'm saying? And I love the fact that there was no like you're not going to get a polished batman you're not going to get a polished suit you're not going to get you know someone who can be different you know because if you're a big batman fan then you know that like bruce wayne is the alter ego and batman is the real person right you know and what and I'm also saying? what i liked also what i liked when piggybacking off what you're saying um there were times in the movie where he actually gets hit. Mm -hmm. He actually takes a punch or two. Because I like the fact that this is, it definitely shows that this is like Mm -hmm. his second year. Because he ain't sitting over there telegraphing, nobody can get a punch off of him like in the past. But I mean, even when when you watch The Dark Knight, right? Mm -hmm. And as choppy as the fight choreo is and the Dark Knight stuff, or like just the Dark Knight trilogy in general, like... The only time when, you know, he would get hit is if, you know, the big villain was hitting, you know, Christian Bell's Batman. Right. You know, which I'm like, like, even in like Batman Begins, like, like only the big villains could like the, the like, get Raish, or, like him. only like Rache could hit him or like only Scarecrow can do something to him. Like, and I like that they made this like, like it, it felt to me like. This is what Bruce Wayne would be in real life. Mm-hmm. Like he's going to get knocked around. He just like you know he's not going to have finesse. He don't got no finesse. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like Bruce Wayne is known for being a master detective, and is trained in every form of martial arts known to man, and is at peak at peak human ability, right? A Batman in his second year ain't going to be that. He's right. not going to have, you know, like that playboy, you know, like people's like, oh, it's a very broody movie. And well, I mean, yeah, because he doesn't know the distinction between the two. Right. He hasn't figured that out. Yet. Like it's so. ba- literally like you get 
how many scenes with Bruce Wayne in his like him like you only get like what three or four scenes as him as Bruce Wayne mm-hmm. if that like you know what I'm saying like majority of the movie is Batman mm-hmm. like and I love the fact that like the whole movie was Batman like most of the time like I don't really care to see the Bruce Wayne parts in the movie because like I know they're hardly gonna like heavily focus on the action in the movie mm-hmm. versus the detective work we haven't really seen detective work in the Batman movie. We only saw a little bit of detective work in um, Batman Returns and a little bit in The Dark Knight, right? This is the first Batman movie, and this is how I felt as a fan. This is the first Batman movie where I left the theater. Where you really see his detective skills like, shine. Right, like that and the fact that like it felt like nothing was missing in this film to me. Like as far as like the Batman character goes, it felt like nothing was missing to me. Like every time I leave or I would leave a Batman um, film or anything that had to do with like like Batman stuff, like I always felt like you know um, something was missing, mm-hmm. you know. And this was a true blue like detective film like seven which i know everybody's been saying it's a lot like seven like seven like chinatown like those big detective movies that we all know and love that's what this movie felt like and it felt like it just so happened that batman is in the film Mm. like and that's why i love the 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 film so much yeah i definitely i definitely get where you're putting down and and definitely when it comes to this is the most detective work we've seen in a live action Batman film. Yes. Um, I know that there's this fan film out there called Dying is Easy, mm-hmm. which kind of definitely before this came out was definitely highlighting his detective work more right. than the action. And this movie, full blown, takes it to a whole nother level. Oh, yeah. Like majority of. And, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. When it comes to showing his detective work the Riddler was the best villain for that kind of investigative work. Bro. So we're going to get into the Riddler now. Um, Paul Dano, shout out to him. You want to, you all slept on him. I was going to say, you want, you want to take, you want to take it first or you want me to take it? I'll, I'll take it. So this man has done, there will be blood, little miss sunshine, prisoners, Swiss army man, and a plethora of other films. Now, you want to talk about somebody that is grossly underrated? Paul Dano is grossly underrated. The range that he has is sneaky dangerous. He can make you afraid of him, but make you feel sorry for him in a very, very mm. uh, wide range way. Yep. Um, the take on the Riddler from a live action standpoint is one of the best live action reinventions of the of a character I've ever seen. And what they were able to do with him went above and beyond what anybody comic book wise thought, what anybody diehard fan thought. They took the Riddler, made him not the wacky, quirky scientist that we are used to seeing mm-hmm. that likes riddles and puzzles. They turned around and made him a vengeful little kid that grew up to be a man that never had a home. He was orphaned. That's what they made him to be. And he basically got lied to a lot Mm -hmm. and came up with a whole puzzle citywide on his own to make Batman look and search out for it, but also reveal... I'm spoiling a lot here. So once again, if you're still on this, I told you and I warned you, don't get mad with me. He also went above and beyond to to reveal police corruption within the very city and also that Bruce Wayne's parents weren't that great. And targeted it, the police department, political figures, and Bruce Wayne himself and costs and which put Alfred in the crosshairs and in the hospital. Luckily, he didn't pass away. So when you have a guy doing that, 
from a puzzle standpoint. Mm-hmm. And then you mix that with Paul Dano's performance. It's lightning in a bottle. And if you open up that cap, you're going to get a masterpiece at work. This is what Paul Dano, because when I saw the casting, this Batman film had so many unique casting choices. I've never seen a a Batman film with this many unique casting choices. Mm -hmm. Usually there's one and the rest of the cast is like, oh, okay. I could see that person being this character. But these this these casting choices were very unique. You can tell Matt Reeves was really being open minded and being like, okay, let me not be married to getting what everybody thinks Commissioner Gordon is gonna look like. Let me not be married to what everybody thinks the Riddler is going to look like. Let me experiment, try new things and bring something really different to the table. Mm. Um and with this especially with Paul Dano being a Riddler. It is like us, like to me, it's like if they made the Riddler turn into Saul a little bit. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely some, uh, mixed with the Jake community. Saul, yeah. yeah. Mixed with the community cult. Yeah. That is help that he reveals that is willing to ride for this. Dude. This man got mm-hmm. an audience. Yeah. Which is, which is crazy. And, uh, you want to touch on Paul Dano's man. Okay. So, I've been waiting for a very, very long time. And I've been saying it for a long time. I was like, I really would love to see them get into the the more methodical and dark side piece of the Riddler. Because like you say, like they always have them be like, like Edward Nigma is always like they have them quirky or they have them, you know, crazy or they have them, you know, but there's a few stories where he is that methodical and he is that dark, you know. So when you watch or when you read things like Hush and you read things like The Longest Halloween, like which this movie had traces of both stories and a few other ones like Year One, um, it's very you know like you said like it makes the non-conventional comic book reader um you know like like how you are now (laughs) you know what i'm saying like you know and there's like there's a lot of people who wouldn't have never thought to see a joker like this have i seen it before yes but again like i tell everybody it's different from reading it than seeing it on the screen right so either way i'm gonna be surprised either way Paul Dano is the best part of this movie. Period. Um, like I always say, your greatest hero is only as great as it's as his best villain. You know, and it's like the whole everything that they did with the Riddler was insane in this movie from beginning to end you know and the the you know the biggest thing like people like i watched ben shapiro's you know um i watched ben shapiro's uh review on the movie and he didn't like it you know but you know he's he's like oh you know like i read longest halloween that's one of my favorite stories but you know, this movie was kind of woke and blah, 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 this, that, and the third. And they're talking about white privilege and all of this other stuff. Well, and the only reason why he's saying that is because uh, Zoe Kravitz literally says, I'm tired of these white privilege people. He's saying that to. Right. She's but saying, you know also I mean? at the same time, uh, Carmine Falcone said the same exact thing in Batman Begins, but it's, it wasn't a problem until a person of color said it. Yeah, right. Yeah, but touch on Paul Dano. Like, but um, like I was saying about Paul Dano, like it's his performance as the Riddler, and then how when he get when he gave himself up in uh, the diner, and when you see his face for the first time outside of the Riddler uh, attire, he looked like Ted Bundy. 
he looked like a killer off uh, the show of Mind like, Hunters. Like and like that's my like that's what like he had that friendly serial killer face. Mm-hmm. Like the Ted Bundys and the you know any other of the you know serial killers that invite you in. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Like and he was calm until you know the the jail scene where he was like oh it wasn't supposed to go like this we were supposed to work together because i did da, 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 this that, and the third which was one of the strongest a lot scenes of, of the movie. right right and like a lot of reviews are well you know at the end it just felt like you know him blowing up and flooding the city and all of that other stuff just felt like it needed to be tie in to show the difference between him and batman what people failed to realize is like that's how the comics are because while Bruce will go to great lengths, he never crosses the line. That's why Joker is like infatuated with him so much and why he stays on Batman so much because Batman won't won't cross that line. You know what I'm saying? Riddler and in a few different stories, Riddler is always the first one to find out that Bruce is Batman. And mm-hmm. he's constantly saying it in the camera. Cameras like this like this damn near this close to him you know and he's like i know who you are bruce wayne i know da 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 bruce wayne like but when they replay the tape back you know you as a fan got to think like oh they oh this is just rambling of you know a crazy person this crazy person's talking to batman mm-hmm. and just calling him bruce wayne you know what I'm saying? Right. Like it and that's the thing, that's the greatest thing about what Matt Reeves did with this movie is he leaves your mind to wander. And that's how good film is done. You know what I'm saying? So Paul Dano, I hate this like I don't know, I've been saying it with a lot of different people. And you know, everybody's always like, Well, you know, they gotta compare the villains. Right. So they was comparing his Riddler to Heath Ledger's Joker. I think it's too soon to make that. I mean, that's a to good me, argument. To me, I think his J- Riddler is better than Heath Ledger's Joker. To me, that's a big statement. And the reason you why sure I you're s- not being a prisoner at the moment. No, like, and the reason why I say that is because, like, and I have people who have seen the movie. I have a friend um, who's seen the movie for the third time, and he's to him, he said they're like this, right? Oh, it's definitely close. Um, to me, I think it like. The thing about Joker is like Joker in the comics says any one of my stories can be a true story, but you'll never know which story is the real story. Mm -hmm. Right. So any iteration of Joker that is played can be his origin story, but you never know. Mm -hmm. Like the whole Merkel story, you know. Right. But you don't know what story is the Joker story so it's going to turn out good regardless because you don't know which story is the real story he's still to this day the only comic book character who doesn't have an alter ego it's just Joker you know that he was in the Red Hood gang fell in that vat became Joker Mm -hmm. that's it right Edward Nygma has always been Edward Nygma right like it just depends on if you're going to get the quirky one or the sadistic serial killer one. Right. And we got the sadistic serial killer one. You know what I'm saying? And his performance was more methodical. I don't think... I'm not saying that Heath Ledger's Joker was bad. Because I very enjoy his... I like, I really do enjoy his performance as Joker. But... You can't keep making his performance as Joker. The status quo for modern villains today. It always goes back to his performance. And I always ask people, and I know it's probably controversial, I always ask people, do you think that he would have the best Joker if he did not pass away? Mm. I always ask that. And the reason is, is because like, prime example, Prime example, look at Joaquin Phoenix's, um, you know, interpretation of Joker. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Look at Jack Nicholson's. They still talk about Jack. Oh, look at my boy from uh, Shameless who was in Gotham. He played uh, two different. He played Jerome and Jerome's twin brother. To me, 
he's wanted to like as a young kid doing Joker, he's one of the dirtiest Joker actors I've seen live action. Mm-hmm. Like, and this is like episodic wise. You know what I'm saying? Right. So, like in the end, like you still saying that Heath Ledger's performance, like when you have more modern performances of Joker, is you know, or or other villains like Well, a lot of people, the way that Nolan worked, a lot of people look at Heath Ledger's Joker as modern. Mm-hmm. So when we look at Paul Dano's Riddler, this is why I'm I used to just jump out there and be right in the middle of the debate. This is why mm-hmm. part of me, like for me, I'm kinda let's wait and see, let time will tell. I look at I have to let things sit before I make that comparison. Because it's easy to get, and I'm not saying you're doing this, you stand on your point. It's easy to get to become a prisoner of the moment, and because mm-hmm. it's fresh in your mind, and because Dark Knight came out in 2008 when you were 17, 18 years old, mm-hmm. recency bias kicks in. Right. I look at, okay, let's give Paul Dano's performance 10 years. Mm hmm and then do the comparison. Right. So now you got Heath Ledger's interpretation of Joker versus Paul Dano's performance of the Riddler. Which one is better than uh, which one is better and why and what has made a bigger impact 10 years, 12 years, mm-hmm. 20 years from now. That's how I view arguments. Right. Like when somebody comes up to me from a music standpoint and goes, "This person in my opinion is better than Michael Prince." I said, "Oh, really?" Right. Look at the influence. Right. I said, if your artist look has, the yeah, look at the catalog. Yeah. If your artist hasn't influenced an entire three to four generations, mm-hmm. we shouldn't even be having this conversation. That's what I'm talking about. So right. I look at overall impact. Do I think Paul Dano has made an impact by doing this version of the Riddler? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But we have to see how it's going to play out and let time tell how big that impact is going to be right. like because see, at this point we don't at this point i think it's a lot of recency bias right like for me it's I, like this is how i view when it comes to comic book movies or anything comic book related if an actor can elevate and like elevate the like the character that they're playing in a way that you've never seen before and elevate your views on that character then they've gone above and beyond what an actor normally does. Right. Because Paul you're Dano's getting, definitely done that. And Paul Dano did that. Everybody's like, Riddler? Why? And what did they what did they bring up? Batman Forever. Jim Carrey. Two surface. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. or when you bring up um Two Face, right? They go to Tom Lee Jones. They go to right. the quirky stuff. And even and uh I forget the actor's name who played Two Face in um The Dark Knight. But I'm like, even that small smidget, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like, like, and I would and personally I want to see them do like cause like, you know, now they're like, oh, well, you know, we're thinking about Joker stuff and like the I think the one that stood out for me the most was like for like another movie Mr. Freeze you I think know. they could circle back around and really do it well I think if you you know I, I definitely think they could um, I will say this though what I hope they don't do whoever that prisoner was at the end mm-hmm. I hope it's not Joker I'm getting tapped out it is Joker I think it's Two-Face did you did you okay so if you go so I don't know if you've gone on YouTube recently. Well, they do the makeup um, with the actor? No, 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 no. So if you go, okay, so you've seen Eternals, right? Yeah. Um, um Drew, what's his name? Drew it? The let me look it up. I think he's Aaron uh, Eckhart was the actor in Two Face that was in the Dark Knight. Aaron, so okay, know. yeah. <laughs> Eternals. Looking up actors now. Jurg, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it's Barry Keegan. Yeah, okay, that's the actor's so, name, Barry Keegan. Barry Keegan. Let me see. Let me see his photo real quick. Yeah. So 
on YouTube, everybody's been asking who was the other man in the cell, right? Mm -hmm. When you initially watched the movie because of the scarring on the face, everybody says Two-Face, right? We all know Two-Face's story. He's in the middle of a um, investigation. Acid was thrown on his face because he was trying to take down Maroonie and Falcone, pretty much. More so Maroonie. And they threw acid in his face and scarred. Yeah. Right. The line where he says there's worse things than being a clown and then the laugh. That's Joker. But what happened was so Matt Reeves came out and he did a it's a six minute video on IGN um, or wherever you choose to watch it. You know, uh, they asked who was the mystery cellmate beside Riddler. Mm -hmm. He said it's the Joker. But he did. He went to the roots of the Joker and where the Joker is based off of. I don't know if many people are into black and white films, but if you know the man who laughs, yeah. that's who the Joker is based upon. Is a based based upon that film. He's based upon the man who laughs. Can I uh, say this for a moment? And I'm gonna look straight in the camera. With all due respect, folks, I am at this moment 31 <laughs> years old. He said, "I'm tired of Joker." <laughs> I'm tired of the Joker stories, dog. Do you know how long I've heard Joker stories since, since I we was kids. five yeah, years we old? I'm tired of it. Stop. We know the stories already. Batman and the Joker go together like peanut butter and jelly. I'm tired Facts. of it. Stop. I don't want no more Joker stories. That was the perfect time to do a whole movie on Two Face, right. a whole freaking movie or something like that, or bring Mister Freeze in. Somebody different, right. man. I want and something see, that's different. That's why I like what Warner, well, what DC is doing now, because now they're going more into the Rogue Gallery. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, like, so what he was saying in that video was like. You know, he went to the roots and instead of it being like he was like, I didn't want to be like Nolan where he had scars. And that's why he smiles. You know what I'm saying? He was like, I didn't want to be like the Joker movie and be like, it's a, you know, it's a uh, take on mental health, like like a take on mental health where like he can't help but laugh like it's a mental disability. He was like, I wanted to make it where it's a condition where he can't stop laughing. Like kind of like how when Joker shoots fear gas, oh, not, uh, laughing gas into people's face and they can continuously laugh until they uh-huh. die. Kind of like that. And that's why his face was disfigured. Mm. And he wanted to take a whole completely different route. Um, he didn't necessarily say that there will be a, like a director's cut. He was like, there's no such, there's no director's cut with me. Like what I shoot is what I shoot. Mm. But he did shoot two scenes. One of the scenes is what we saw at the end of the movie. The other scene was that they was going to kind of do the whole Merkel story where the officer ends up turning into, uh, well, Stephen Merkel turns into the Joker. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, they was going to play it like that, right? But he was like, when he watched the cut of the film with both scenes in it, he was like, the one that I did at the end ties it more together. He was like, it's not necessarily saying that we're going to be doing Joker because in your mind's mind, his first year of being Batman, he already took down Joker. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's why it's leaving it to interpretation for what he does next because the Easter eggs they had in there are crazy. Prime example, that adrenaline that he pulled out um, at the end, when he turned that dude's face into uh, mashed potatoes, mm-hmm. <laughs> he did that several times. Like you know what I'm saying. So like that part, it could have been anything. Like it was green, and in a smaller vial, that could have been Bane, mm-hmm. or it could have been um, Scarecrow's fear toxin. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like because what most people don't know is that Bruce built he would shoot himself up with fear toxin to build an immunity to it Mm -hmm. you know 
but if you chemically change it, it can be a booster oh, okay. to where you don't feel fear at all, right? Or it can just be green adrenaline. Who knows? Right. You know, but there's so many interpretations personally, um, and what and and what they're doing, like different Batman villains, like prime example with Batgirl and that film or yeah, in that film they're doing Firefly with Brandon Fraser playing Firefly. We never thought we'll see Brandon Fraser as a villain. Right. He's gonna be a villain now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So um so let, like me ask, so let me ask you this like with I, 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 I definitely agree with you know I would like to see Mr. Freeze I'm just tired of Joker stories man like, like enough. I mean I mean even me as a fan like it's like how I am with Star Wars like I'm tired of seeing the Skywalker line like I want to see something else right you know what I'm saying like I don't get tired of Joker I will say that but I want to see my point I want to see different other villains, villains. like yeah. I want to see Mr. Freeze because technically Mr. Freeze isn't a bad guy he does bad things because he's trying to find a cure for his wife right and that's a sad story to play. Right. One that I don't think people would be ready for. Because like, because then at that point, he's if Matt Reeves does if Matt Reeves does do Mr. Freeze, then he's gonna level with those people who have lost their significant others, husbands or wives. Right. And that's all he's trying. He freeze froze his wife and an incident happens and he turns to Mr. Freeze to the point where like he can't be in a normal temperature room. Mm-hmm. You gotta put on a special suit. Yeah, you got. You gotta put on a special suit. Exactly to to keep himself alive, Mm -hmm. and also he's trying to keep himself alive while trying to find a cure for his wife's cancer because there isn't one. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's why I would really love because then at that point, bro, it's gonna hurt you, right? Like then you would have a Batman movie that hurts you to your core because everybody like, like you know with Bruce losing his parents like that hits certain people you know for people who have lost their you know their parents or lost a parent but when it comes to Mr. Freeze's story it's kind of like John Q right John Q hits home Mm -hmm. because at the end it's just a man who's doing bad things but not a bad person to save his son Mm -hmm. because the hospital won't do it right like, yeah, I definitely, I definitely get that. I just, I just hope there's more stories now. Another comparison that people are jumping the gun on, and I'm just gonna say this here, mm-hmm. and then we're gonna get to uh, Zoe Kravitz's part, mm-hmm. and uh, we'll we'll touch on uh, um, Jeffrey Wright's Commissioner Ooh, Gordon cool. too. Um, I I like the tone of Gotham. It had nice tones of browns and it's and real Gotham. It's a real Gotham. It's real Gotham. Mud tones and reds. <laughs> Mud tones and reds. Yes. You know what I mean? So that's literally that's literally Gotham for you. Now I will say this also, and I wanna um touch on this. A lot of people are doing the comparison of which one is now the better Batman movie standard. Is it Dark Knight or is it this one? My personal opinion, I I said this about the Paul Dano and Heath Ledger situation. Well, t- let time play itself out so you can really see the impact of what both films do. To me, there's an 18 year old somewhere seeing the Batman movie like I saw Dark Knight and going, I want to be a filmmaker one day. Literally. So let that film impact how it's going to impact and then let maybe like another 10 years go by and then we have a then we can revisit the conversation it's just my opinion Mm -hmm. because i don't like recency bias Mm -hmm. um let's see what the impact is first before we jump the gun and say well this is where i stand and this is the reason why and then turns out it's just because the person's a prisoner in the moment Mm -hmm. um so that's where i am with that um i want to touch on uh real quick Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman in that role and I think she did a fantastic job mm-hmm. and what's crazy to me is is that they labeled her too urban to play Catwoman in the Dark Knight which is god awful to me that is crazy it's bullshit that's crazy and I, and I say that because Catwoman 
in different even in different animations as far as movie like animated movies have gone like when they did batman year one she was a person of color uh-huh. you know what i'm saying um they've made her even when they did a standalone animated short she was a person of color you go back in the day with adam west batman the third person to play Catwoman was Eartha Kitt, mm-hmm. who is a person of color. Right. So to say somebody is too urban for a character because of their skin tone, <laughs> like, like, bro, we in 2022. Right. And you're in a, and you're playing a role like, in a very urban environment in an inner city. Like, duh. But Come on, my now. thing is like. It's fucking Batman. Right. Gotham is supposed to be a shithole, but Bruce is trying to do his best to make it better. You know what I'm saying? And Gotham, truth be told, is supposed to be a multicultural city. A lot of cities in the U.S. are multicultural. I know some people don't like hearing that, but there's a it's we're a melting pot. It's 2022. Deal with it. Like, but also it's like. It's like you were saying about, you know, like the people comparing it to Dark Knight. Um, I compared this one, this Batman movie, to all Batman movies, including the Tim Burton stuff. Mm. While Tim Burton stuff was dark, it wasn't like that. It was grit. dark in visual tone. Yeah, like it was like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? But that's that's his that's his style of directing. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like that German expressionism and all that type of stuff. Like it was just dark right dark like this is like film noir right you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. like for me gotham was a character in this film this is the first time gotham has been like a legitimate character in this film right like so like like for me i'm as bro like i'm seeing everything you know i'm like i'm not even at the hype part like i'm just like like everything is a character in this film like this is the first detective batman Right. That we get legitimate detective Batman. This the first dark and gritty Batman. Like this felt like I don't know if you guys remember back in the nineties, but if you guys ever remember Dark City, uh-huh. it had them dark tones like Dark City. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like that felt like because essentially Gotham is supposed to be a mix between Jersey and Chicago. Thought it was supposed to be like New York. Like it's 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 like a melding of like the darker cities right but like same thing with like metropolis is supposed to be like the more brighter cities while right. you know gotham is supposed to be like a Rittier. mixture of the darker cities right. right so it's like they had real dark undertones like it played a character like they really made like gotham when you read batman comics gotham is a shit uh huh. Sucks to suck, but I mean, you know, and the only times where you see it like, and like even when you like prime example, when you fast forward to the future, there's not one person who watches your podcast who hasn't seen Batman Beyond. Right. Like, there's no person you can talk to except for like these younger kids who, and even still then, who don't know Batman Beyond. Even in the future. Gotham was still a shithole. Having its issues. Like, you you know what I'm saying? Like, it was still, and this is the first, like, they, like, boy, did they lay it on thick with Gotham (laughs) in this film. (laughs) But, I mean, like, I think it was beautifully shot. It was light where it needed to be light. Um, But I don't know, like, every other Batman film felt like like it's supposed to be dark and gritty and like like Gotham is depicted as dark, gritty, rough, you know, like every like everywhere. I think this is the, is the one film I've seen Batman in like the daylight sometimes. Like in certain scenes. Like uh, well, I mean, you've seen him in daylight in he he's done a few daylight stuff in uh well what half of the Batman gear on and like the Dark Knight trilogy, he right. was doing stuff in a day. Right. Or and Batman Forever, like he would transition, and then it just randomly turned dark out of nowhere. Like you mm-hmm. know what I'm like. Uh, so it's like, I felt like this one, 
was like like literally there wasn't light until like the end of the movie right and then even during some like like the funeral scene it was daytime but it was an overcast but it was an over like you know what i'm it was right. it was always rainy it was always dark like even during the day it's dark like this felt like it je- like they it felt like they pulled the comic book like right and i love that and i think that's why i love that they filmed this film majority in england you know because england has some of those like at night has some of those like darker tones Mm -hmm. and with most batman films they tend to stay in america right most of the time to the point you can recognize the city right exactly so like when it gets to the scene where like they're panning and he's like coming around in his motorcycle right and you see that big plaza that's england dude right like you know what i'm saying so this is the first time where we like legitimately see like a real darker uh city tone for batman yep absolutely we're gonna move in then to jeffrey wright's uh commissioner gordon and uh he did a fantastic job jeffrey wright is another they have picked this cast is so They've picked a cast that has such a wide range of mm-hmm. of just hey I can act and pull something out of hat out of nowhere. It's just fantastic to see. And Jeffrey Wright was always typecast back in the day. Oh yeah, look at the first uh, the the more modern Shaft. Yeah, when he played the villain with Christian Bale in that movie as well. I mean, he kind of stole the show because he, <laughs> yo, he full blown. You would have thought he was like I thought he was no. M- growing up, I did think he was Latin, right? <laughs> Until no, you know, I think he was like full blown Dominican. Like I yeah. thought the way he oh, was yeah, acting, he was, he was like full blown, blown Dominican yeah. in that job. Yeah, like he was like um, he was like. He was like, Papa, what's up? Like he was right. like, Primo, what's up? Like right. you know what I'm saying? And and to and and just to see that, and then to see him in this, and it's like you see the wide range. You look over 20 years, it's like mm. wow. His, his I mean, even in like his dramatic is stuff crazy. is crazy, yep. bro. And he can jump in a role like that, right? Like you know what I'm saying. So, but his commission of Gordon, like, it's up there. Like I definitely like. I mean, we haven't really seen that many versatile roles for Commissioner Gordon. Pretty much in like from Batman to Batman and Robin, the guy who played Commissioner Gordon for those films, um, he was like, he was more like the older Commissioner Gordon. So he was pretty much a yes man in that one. Right. Um, You didn't really see real character, like a more character type Gordon until uh, Gary Oldman played him. Right. In the Dark Knight trilogy, right, which made people want to look more into um, Commissioner Gordon, and then if you're a fan of Gotham, then you know Ben McKenzie playing that younger um, Commissioner Commissioner Gordon. Gordon, like, and what his mindset would be, you know, fresh after the military, pretty much, like that was really good. Yep. Um, and Jeffrey Wright just added, or even um, when JJ, like you only seen him like a little bit, but when, you know, uh, my man J. Jonah Jameson played, you know, and he's coming back to play Commissioner Gordon. Um, you know, when you see him play Commissioner Gordon, like it felt like that more comic book with the, you know, the the big fedora hat type, yeah. you know, Gordon, like the more detective looking to Gordon. This Gordon felt more like a, um, like a street detective, but also like that Commissioner Gordon that we love, who was like, "Well, I mean, I don't know what else to do as a man of the force, so let me look outside of the normal reaches of what I can do." Right, and then on top of that, he's kind of like blown because I'm trying to find, I'm trying to find where the right is at, and then I got people that I'm in arms with. That are corrupt. acting corrupt, mm-hmm. and it's crazy. In which it's a take on today. We've seen corrupt police and the whole entire issues and stuff like that, which we're not going to get into. I mean, we've but. seen, but I mean, but we've seen multiple movies where police corruption is always a thing. Right, Training Day. Right, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Right. Like it's true. Um, and to see how he reacts to that and rises to the occasion, and maybe it's unorthodox, but and we've never seen a movie where. 
he's very protective over Batman, right. but blatantly is being like boldly saying yeah, like, yeah. yo, this man is by my side. Well, literally like Commissioner Gordon has always been like that. Like they've always had a mutual respect. You but know we're, I feel like we're seeing, yeah, I definitely agree with but that. You but you see I feel it like more in this We're film, seeing it more like, in this film than any other one. Right, Like, and, but because you didn't really see it until Dark Knight Rises where, you know, he pretty much tells Gordon that he's Bruce Wayne. Right. You know, and um you know for me like this is more the gordon that i know mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying that's right. more family with gordon while gordon still doesn't know that he's bruce wayne right until you know things happen with if you you know reading like stuff like the killing joke mm -hmm. um you know, something happens to Barbara and then something also happens to him. Barbara gets shot in the spine. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's not until you see the flip where he's like, oh, hell no. Like, like, I don't care about Batman. This is my baby. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, but this felt like the Gordon that I know a lot of people was like, you know, he kept saying like the same thing in the film. And where he was like, Jesus Christ. But... Also, y'all got to remember, like, he's in his second year and these things called villains didn't exist two years ago. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that's always the running theme of superhero films. Like, oh, these things didn't exist until you heroes popped up. Right. Like, but there was still sick people out in the world, though. Doing God knows what. Right. Like. There's always been Riddlers. There's always been Jokers. There's, you know what I'm saying? It's just because they have a look. Yeah, it's just a spark. Yeah, like because they have a look, then, you know, it's different from the norm. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But the way that they do it is what surprises Gordon. And he's like, bro, I'm not equipped to do this. Mm -hmm. Like, this is not what they teach you in, like, in the academy, you know? And for a man being on the force as long as he has, pre-Bruce being Batman. All right. Like he hasn't run anything. Like yeah. Like he hasn't run anything. Right. Like, like if you're a detective, right? What would you do? Oh, you're definitely gonna go with the unorthodox. Like I gotta solve riddles. Are you kidding me? Usually the clues is right there in front of my right. face. I go find the guy. And you if read. the DNA, if the DNA and the GPS stuff right. matches up, and the stuff online matches up, I'm gonna go get and the you guy. You do the work. You do but, the detective work. Yeah. But then by that time, you don't know what's gonna happen to that person. Right. And with a person whose mind is so fractured like that, right, you don't know where they're gonna go with everything. Yeah, because how how long are you gonna? Because now it's it's like literally the first forty eight. That person has like a like a eight hour window of being alive right. or dead at Zodiac that point. Zodiac killer, right? That's pretty much what you're dealing with. Like you're dealing with a <laughs> you Gotham know what I'm like, You don't killer. know. Like same thing with like Red Dragon, right? You like they had to go and talk to a serial killer to to catch a serial killer. They had to go speak to Hannibal Lecter to go catch the red dragon All right you know what i'm saying so what do you do granted batman ain't all there but you go to someone else who isn't all there to catch someone who isn't there you know what i'm saying it's yeah, in a, in a, a weird, case it's, of fight fire with fire right i definitely get that so before we close up out of here uh what are your overall rating out of 10 for the film uh, I'd definitely give it a nine, a nine or a ten. I say like nine. I'll say like I like like at the beginning, you know, I you know I definitely was in that. This is the best Batman movie. I mean, it does like now, you know, after it's selling, like you know, it does it does have some of its flaws here and there. Um, very minimal though. Very yeah, very very minimal. Mm -hmm. So no, you know, I'll give it a ten. Because as far as like comic book accuracy wise and um, performance wise and the aesthetic, that's all 100%. Yeah. Um, as everyone knows, like no one comic book movie just goes off of one particular story unless you're Watchmen. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, so like I'll definitely like yeah, it, like it's literally like like one of the perfect formula Batman movies I've ever seen. 
in my lifetime. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll uh, I'll give it a a nine, nine out of ten. I feel like ten. I feel like people that say ten out of ten, I feel like they're just like I said, become prisoners of the moment. Um, so yeah, I'll give it a nine out of ten. So um, with that being said, this has been another edition of Audio Air Strike. Miguel, I want to thank you so much for coming in. Oh, thank wait, you so man. much. Uh, something a little bit different, something a little bit more lighthearted. Giving y'all, we're gonna start uh, every now and again. If a big movie comes out, we're gonna be doing movie reviews on here. And just kind of, I'm going to kind of share my opinion because I am a filmmaker first. Um, you know what I mean? So I am going to start doing a couple more uh, movie reviews and start cranking them a little bit more uh, with these episodes. So, yep, that is pretty much it. I'm Everett Hall McNeil. This is Audio Airstrike. Make sure that you guys follow us on TikTok. Uh, we are going to start posting clips on there. We already have started posting clips on there. And also make sure that you guys are checking out our YouTube page. Uh, the full version of this episode from a visual standpoint will be uploaded so you can catch the review, not just the audio, but the visuals as well. So on YouTube, that's where we have our longer for content. If you want to catch some short clips, go over on TikTok. Um, if you want to check out trailers, little special trailers that we're going to post mm-hmm. uh, with every episode, uh, you can go to our Instagram and any special photos or announcements, something like that. So that's where Instagram will be the trailers and the announcements. TikTok will be the short clips. YouTube will be the longer form content. And that is the direction that we will go in 2022. I'm looking forward to see what they got going on more in D.C. And also. Yep. yep. We have. Uh, well, we have one down yep. and we have uh, four to go. Yep. Um, Don't forget Marvel, too. We got Marvel. Yeah, we have Marvel as well, too. Marvel this year has a total of three. I think so. Um, Because you have uh, Morbius, Doctor Strange. Or no, is it just two? No, uh, Love uh, Love and Thunder. Oh, yeah. So you got three for them. And then for DC, we have, we well, we're down one now. Uh Uh, So we still have black adam um which i'm highly ready for because uh it's about time dr fate showed his face in the film right <laughs> yeah, it should be good um and we also have uh the flash which i'm highly ready to see uh we get michael keaton and ben affleck in the same movie who would have thought yeah it's pretty crazy so we'll <laughs> definitely uh um and then we also have uh aquaman mm-hmm and yeah, bad girl. I'm interested to see how that goes with our Aquaman uh, sequel coming out. So, yep, we'll definitely uh, cover it all. And we once again want to thank you for listening to the 201st episode of Audio Airstrike. We got more we're going to crank out. Until next time, everybody, y'all take care. Have a good one.